starting from scratch with Scala Native. Um, so this is a talk about Scala Native. If that's what you came for, you're in the right room. Um, it's also just a, sort of an introductory talk on systems programming in general and how to do systems programming in Scala. Maybe even an argument pedagogically for teaching people how to do systems programming in Scala. Because if you really want to go under the hood, you have to have to learn what your computer actually does at, at the hardware level, right? Um, more conceptually, I'd say, it's also a, just to talk about working with emerging technology, right? About improvised solutions to real world problems. Um, and about really relying on your, your operating system itself as a platform rather than like frameworks or like uh, more elaborate virtual machines and runtimes. Um, dot, dot, dot. This is a talk about how to get things done without the JVM that we've come to know and or love. Um, so what, what's the concrete non-hand wavy uh, portion of the talk? Um, it's going to be a crash course in Scala Native and just like systems programming. We're going to learn some pointer arithmetic. Um, and then we're going to dive deep into some actual exercises, because the only way you really do learn to do this is by actually writing programs. Um, we're going to use the Google Ingrams data set. Have people heard of that? Um, it's a nice, big, flat file, like medium data, a couple, couple gigabytes. Um, we're going to implement like three sort of simple algorithms on it, both in like a naive JVM Scala way and then also in a Scala native way. Um, and because I try to be empirical, we're going to have like uh, performance numbers, because um, uh, I, like, I like data. Um, and then after that, that concludes the empirical portion of the talk. Then I'll wave my hands and make some crazy generalizations um, about me. So I'm, I am a Scala native contributor. I contributed to the dot two and dot three releases, but I'm not in the core dev team. I'm speaking only for myself here. Um, the uh, the yeah like like we were saying in the introduction, I am working on a book on Scala Native for Pragmatic. Um, it's called Modern Systems Programming in Scala. Um, I'm hoping to be able to announce an official like release date uh, and like start doing early access online releases in the near future. Um, so definitely um, look me up on Twitter if you want to find out more about that. I'm a software engineer at M1 Finance, uh, a finance uh, financial services startup in Chicago. Um, we run uh, Spark, Akka. Um, um, stuff like that every day for a sort of a, a, a high throughput trading platform. Um, and on Twitter, I'm at Richard Whaling. Um, if I just tweeted out the slides, I tweeted out my notebooks with the data, um, and I tweeted out the talk I gave on Scala Native at um, Strange Loop last year, which was about network programming and building a web server in Scala Native. Um, so that yeah, that's all on my Twitter stream. Um, but with that being said, let's get started. Um, so what's Scala Native, right? Uh, first of all, Scala Native is Scala. It's not a new programming language. It's the regular Scala that we all write. Um, in particular, it's a, it's a Scala C plugin, right? And an SBT plugin that drives it. Um, and what that Scala C plugin gives you is efficient, effectively a, an alternative backend for the Scala compiler, such that instead of emitting JVM bytecode, it emits LLVM bytecode. Uh, LLVM, right, is um, uh, the 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 the, the um, system level linker used in macOS, used by Rust, used in Clang. Um, a really great, uh, even though it says LLVM in the name of it, it's really just a machine code compiler backend. Um, it allows us to get a true native binary um, ahead of time compilation with our Scala code, uh, with all the benefits that come with that, like low overhead, tiny, uh, reproducible, portable binary packages, um, and quick startup time. Um, that makes it great for command line tools, um, and that's most of what people have been using it for um, so far. Like people have demoed like Scala C running in Scala Native, for example, and things like Scala Format, which is really cool. And it's progressing rapidly with like library support also. Um, but that's not always easy because you don't actually have a JVM, right? <laughs> it's not there. There is no JVM. Um, the way it gets anything done is that Scala Native does include implementations of many of the most commonly used JDK classes. Um, but what it's actually doing is that those are like stub implementations that are just invoking um, C functions provided by the ANSI C standard library or the operating system under the hood, right? Um, and what makes this possible is that Scala Native provides these incredibly robust and expressive um, types and operators uh, 
for effectively a Scala DSL for C, um, which once once you you get the sense of what that can do, it's incredibly powerful and exciting. And that's what I'm, this talk is about. It's not just about how to compile your existing programs with a different plugin. It's about how to write programs designed for Scala native that perform like a C program, um, and how what a sort of mind shift that is. Um, so like to get started though, like this this works right. Like if it's a plain vanilla command line regular Scala, you add an extra line to your build.sbt, you add a plugins.sbt file with one line, it Scala native compiles it, you get a native binary. Like it just works. I have too many slides to do live demos, I promise this works. Uh, but you can also do this, which is not very different. Um, but there's two things. One, the, the string literal has a C in front of it. That's because it's a C style string. And we'll talk a lot <laughs> more than you want about how strings work in C in a second. And also, the function is now printf. Um, has anyone seen printf before in their programming days? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is a. Uh, this, this is the real glibc printf we're talking about here. This isn't another function that happens to be named printf. This is invoking the printf from libc. It works because Scala natives types, like this C string type, are actually binary compatible with the, the C ABI. And LLVM gives you all the calling conventions and stuff basically for free. Right. Um, so unlike regular Scala string substitution, for the people who haven't seen it, um, the way uh, printf format strings work is that percent %s is a placeholder for a string. And then it takes a variable number of arguments. Um, you need to line up the number of arguments you give it with the number of like wildcards in your format string. Um, it's kind of gross. I'll talk more about how it's problematic later. Um, but you get all the good and the bad of like powerful C standard library stuff, which I, I find really exciting because I'm a dorky old C hacker at heart. Um, so like, but what, what are these things, um, right? So the, the idea of a C string is that uh, it's really just a, a bunch of bytes, one after the other, one ASCII character per byte. And then the, the trick is that at the end, there's a zero byte that marks the end of the string. And it's all in contiguous memory. Um, because of that, you don't actually store the length or any metadata. Literally, the, the, the value of the C string, um, oddly enough, is just the address of the very first character in the C string. And there's a lot of we semantic weirdness that comes from this. And the, if you're squinting at this and thinking, wait, that doesn't make sense, it doesn't entirely make sense, and it's broken in a lot of ways. But that's what C gives us. Um, and if we want to write programs that really go at like C speed, we sort of have to deal with it for now. Um, so th this is sort of a jumping five slides ahead. Under the hood in Scala natives, um, like built in, C string is just an alias for a pointer to a C car, right? which is the equivalent of car star for people who've seen string. A pointer is just a generic type in Scala native, which actually makes them, for me, much easier to work with and much easier to teach than C's sort of opaque syntax um, around reference, uh, reference types and stuff like that. Um, double spoiler alert, C car is actually just an alias for byte. Unfortunately, that means it's signed. Um, I'm of the who on earth would ever want a signed byte camp, but whatever, we deal with it. Um, oh, and the other thing is all these pointer types are going to be mutable. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of immutable style and immutable everything, but uh, when you're at when you're working with the bare metal, every, everything is mutable. All you're doing is mutating memory, because that's that's how you're implementing the ability to like do computations um, at a low enough level. Um, so I, I think hard about how to imp how to provide like clean, functional, immutable facades over um, some of this mess. Um, I'm definitely not stylistically advocating for one thing or the other, though. Um, so like with that, we can write like a simple program that sort of exercises and demonstrates some of what we, we and maybe learn a little more about um, C strings, I guess. Um, so the idea is we can just take a hello world string. Uh, we can get its length uh, with the string length um, function. Again, C standard lib. Um, we can ask printf to both print out the content of it and its address. The percent %p formatter is going to give us the address for a pointer, tell us how long it is. Um, but we're also going to ask it to distinguish the length of the string from the size of the string value. Um, and when you print this out, you'll see what I'm talking about. There's a there's a there's an interesting difference here that's not always um, apparent for when you've spent you know 20 years working in languages like Java and Python, where strings have something more like value semantics instead of reference semantics. 
Um, but the idea is once we have the string, then we can just do a for loop over the over the the length of it, right? Uh, to get the offset of each character, um, and then we can just grab them uh, like we would just any other kind of array accessor, because you can treat um, you can treat pointers basically like unsafe index sequences, um, and then print each of the characters out, and just uh, we can look at their binary um, values while we're at it, because hey, we're we're working with bytes here, right? Um, so did I get everything? Um, yeah, I think this is what's uh, so when we run it, the, the output looks like this. Um, and just to highlight the thing that's really interesting, right, is that um, the string itself has an address. Um, the string is <laughs> that offset, that formatted means a little off. The, the string is itself 12 bytes long, which is kind of a lie because it takes 13 bytes of storage. If you count out these lines I'm printing out, there's 13 one byte bytes in the, the string, and that's because the string length function in C doesn't count the null terminating byte that has to be there at the end or everything breaks. Um, but the, the other thing I wanted to call out is that um, Right, the actual string value, the pointer value that we're working with, um, is eight bytes long, right? And that's uh, because we're working on a 64-bit architecture. Uh, size of a pointer of any pointer value to any type is exactly the size of the native machine word, which is also exactly eight bytes, right? Um, and that's uh, precisely the the address is the value that we've printed here, this OX55 thing. Um, Right. Um, so maybe from from this we can actually generalize a little more um, about strings um, and try to like take take another step back and get to a sense of how pointers work. Um, right. Um, so uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to introduce the two really powerful things that Scala Native gives you for working with pointers: um, pointer address arithmetic. Uh, which is horribly unsafe and an easy way to break everything, and uh, pointer address dereference, which is even worse. <laughs> um, right? Uh, because a C string is a pointer um, to a byte, we can actually re-implement the array lookup we were doing before, right? where we were just treating it like an index sequence. We can implement a constant time index sequence lookup with pointer arithmetic. Because uh, we have addition, right? We have the base address of the string, and we're just adding the offset to it. That gives us the address of the the nth or the ith, the nth character of the string. Um, and then once we have the address of any character in the string, we can dereference it um, and see the the dereference operator is star. I think it's the same in like Go and Rust. Um, in Scala Native, it's the exclamation. It's a prefix exclamation mark uh, or bang operator, um, but it does the same thing. So the idea is this is should print us roughly the same thing as before. The only difference is because we're computing the addresses of each individual byte in the string. Um, we can print those out too, um, which will maybe illustrate or prove what I'm claiming about how strings are um, are laid out um, in memory, right? Um, so we have the same string. Um, the the things that are really interesting here, right, um, is that literally the address of the string is exactly the address of the first character in the string. Every single byte in the string does have a a unique and fixed address. Um, but what, what also follows from that, right, is that the type system <laughs> of C doesn't distinguish between a pointer to one character and a pointer to a arbitrary, dynamically, dynamically like, uh, sized array of characters. Um, that, that pointer is sort of this box of a thing, or a sequence-like thing, or an integer-like thing, in a way that um, has historically made it really hard to teach like C and pointers, right? I, spent like probably six weeks of my systems class in college like struggling with it and not really getting it until I wrote actual programs. Um, so if anyone's feeling like I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you really fast, I am. <laughs> um, but uh, a lot of this becomes a lot more clear once you've written some programs and get a sense of how these ideas all sort of depend on each other and form consistent like disciplines and practices. Um, so from what we like have observed about strings so far, then we can just sort of um, make some, uh, just sort of recap some inferences about how pointers work, um, right? So in general, a pointer is just the, the numeric address of a byte somewhere in memory. 
um, in every modern architecture, the pointers are the same size as the machine word. It's not like we're going to compile code for a PDP 11 here. Um, and that, in general, you can just treat the entire address space of your memory as just an index sequence of bytes, right? Most of them are not valid to access because they're unmapped, uh, but it's you can think of the memory as just one giant byte array, basically. Um, and uh, as I was saying earlier, the the sort of the the pain point, right, is that. Um, there's all this sort of, uh, when you're working with like pointers to bytes, you lose all this contextual information that a modern type system would capture. Like, is this one thing? <laughs> is this many things? <laughs> um, uh, do we statically know the, the size of these things? Um, and I mean, we're getting so good at type level uh, uh, computation in the Scala community. I, sort of feel like we might be able to solve a lot of these problems by building on top of what C has like uh, given to us here. Um, but that's uh, sort of uh, above my, my level. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a C hacker. So uh, we're going to stay really down in the, the nitty gritty for the rest of this talk. <laughs> uh, cool. Um, and uh, point, also, just to like lay it out there, uh, pointer arithmetic is, is totally unsafe. There's no way it's going to check if you're doing arithmetic off the end of a pointer, in which case you'll either corrupt your data, see data you're not supposed to, or like segfault your program. Um, you do get a few help, a few bits of help. Like if you know your pointer is typed, um, because you can have like pointers to ints and arrays of ints, it'll increment by the size of the thing you're, um, the 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 thing you know you're containing at least. Um, and you'll see what I mean by that in like 20 slides, <laughs> 15 minutes from now. Um, the other cool thing that Scala Native does with pointers, and then we're really close to writing actual code, um, is uh, the way it handles stack allocation. Um, unlike C, unlike Java, unlike Go and Rust, um, Scala Native actually has an explicit operator for stack allocating um, uh, variables um, uh, via pointers. Um, what's really cool about this is that it allows Scala Native to maintain a bright line between these sort of manually managed pointers that are unsafe um, and that require all these like scary pointer discipline techniques. Um, while also maintaining a sort of clean room where all the normal, like garbage collected, memory safe, <laughs> like sort of vanilla Scala stuff lives. I know I've been talking about all the scary, um, scary pointer stuff for like 15 minutes now, uh, but I do definitely want to reiterate: Scala Native has like a garbage collector and safety and regular semantics. If you want to use it, this talk is about how not to do that. <laughs> but uh, what's really cool is that because we have this. Um, um, the stack allocation operator, we can very easily and explicitly um, grab these sort of short-lived pointers off the stack. Um, the cool thing about it um, with stack allocation in particular is that they're sort of semi-automatic. Um, the, uh, the actual like C call stack will maintain the, 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 the stack pointer as uh, functions are called and returned um, via the C ABI, right? Um, so what that basically gives you is any amount of stack allocation you want to do is a constant time, uh, just an increment to the, the stack pointer, basically. Um, so it's it's just about as fast as physically possible. The only thing that's dangerous is if you accidentally return it from a function, um, then you're going to have a pointer into some piece of stack that's going to get clobbered or has already been clobbered. Um, so it won't necessarily protect you from some of those errors. Um, we have a few other ways to get pointers. There's heap um, pointers, which come from malloc, the famous C malloc fun function, which we'll talk about um, in the next major section. Um, we also have this really cool zone allocator that I don't have slides on, and I have way too much content as it is, but it's really neat. And you should uh, look up some of the material on it, because it's actually really powerful. Um, so like all this said, right? this is all kind of scary power tool of uh, about as low level as um as as programming languages get right uh, but the benefit of this is that it makes working with with c and c foreign functions um really clean and really easy um, not only does it make the compatibility really good, but it makes writing and generating the bindings really easy. Um, you don't need like special headers. You can just put like an extern object like this in your application code, and Scala Native. That's enough for Scala Native to call out to to C functions. Um, here, I've just like written out little bindings for like 
part of the C standard I.O. header, right? Um, Scala Native actually provides these, um, so you wouldn't need to provide them. But if you wanted to write your own, you'd do it like this. And it's exactly the same if you have like dynamic third-party libraries. Um, in my last talk, I showed how to do this for libuv, the, um, the Node.js event loop C library, right? Um, it's generally pretty straightforward to just, all you have to do is translate the signature of the C function to the equivalent Scala Native function. And it really just works. Um, so you, you lose the JVM, but what you gain is everything the ANSI or POSIX C libraries give you, or anything a, a third-party C library gives you. And as it turns out, there are robust C um, libraries out there for quite a few useful things we might want to do. And it makes you reconsider exactly like what the limits of what we can and can't do at this sort of low-level um, way of approaching things. Um, the other, but I also think we, we have the option of, of improving um, upon C, just because Scala is very, very good at abstraction and safety. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to aim at that where I can, but I have to move pretty fast. I'm thinking I'm probably a little bit over time uh, for this part of the talk. Um, the, the like five standard C functions that we need for like the first couple exercises are, are these five. We have printf, which we've already seen, right? Um, it's just a formatted like uh, printing function. We have fgets, which just reads a line of text um, from a file. Um, it reads it into a buffer. It gets a count to make sure it doesn't overflow the buffer. Um, it's one of the safer, better um, standard I/O functions. Um, Scanf is a formatted input uh, function. It's sort of the dual of printf. It takes a format string in the same form. You'll see it in a second. Uh, but basically reads data in from a buffer, from a string or a file um, based on a formatted input string. Um, it's kind of broken, um, and it's. Uh, there, there are better solutions, but it's sort of the standard one, and it's very, very fast, as you'll also see shortly. Um, last but not least, you have the string comparator, which will tell you whether two strings, um, whether one's uh, lesser or greater than the other. Um, and then string copy, which all of the string copying functions in the C standard library are broken, um, sort of embarrassingly so. So um, we have to just fix that because it's it's unacceptable. <laughs> um, there's a bunch. There's some weird edge cases where it will successfully copy data from one string to another, but if the source is larger than the destination, it won't overflow the destination buffer, but it'll fill it right up to the end without term adding the terminating zero at the end, which means that operation is okay, but the next time any operation tries to look for a terminating zero, it will go off the end and blow up everything. And trying to even like test or debug systems like that when you're assured that <laughs> you will not see the bug at the at the, the the point in your code at which it originates is just sort of um, devilish <laughs> to use a strong word. Um, but I, I don't want to go too deep into this. Uh, but it's just there, there's going to be a few other things where we really have to wrap or fix what C gives us to get anything done. So y'all have been really awesome and patient. <laughs> now let's write some actual code. Um, so we have the, the Google Ngrams data set. It's publicly available. If you have a lot of bandwidth, it's pretty easy to download. It's about um, just all the one the word counts are 50 gigabytes. Um, it's, it's literally counts of all the words from all the books Google Google scanned. Um, it's in tab delimited text files, which are great and easy to process in every programming language under the sun. Um, each line ha is in the form word, year, because they're all sorted by year, uh, the count by that year, and then the dot count. Um, the dot count is the number of documents the word occurs in, which is like uh, important for like TF, IDF, and other information retrieval calculations. We're going to parse it, but we're not going to use it for anything. Um, they're all separated by the letter of the word, um, and we're going to just use the A file, which is about two gigabytes, which is medium data. It's enough to like make a program work. <laughs> um, so and uh, really nice to just a, a good solid like data crunching problem. Um, so the three algorithms we want to work th through are what's the most frequent word in this file? Um, what are the top 20 most frequent words? And we're going to sort the file to do that. And then what are the top 20 if we add together all the words by year, right? Because they're, they're split out by year. They, they look like this. Also, they have a lot of weird words or weird proper nouns or like scanning errors. <laughs> Things aren't words. Um, and they also, a lot of them have part of speech tags like this. Um, but 
I'm a failed computational linguist, so if I start talking about part of speech tags, we're going to be here all night. Um, so let's just uh, assume that the thing on the left-hand column is, in fact, the word for now, um, and parse it like that. Um, so if we were going to implement this in like vanilla Scala, I'd say this is a naive but simple enough implementation, right? To just find the most frequent, like just have vars for the maximum word and the count and the year that we've seen so far, iterate over, standard in, split them, pull out the things we care about, um, check and update our vars, right? Um, and you could certainly optimize over this. People can do a high speed IO on the JVM pretty well. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd argue this is at least a, a good like first first attempt. Um, so how do we do this if we're going to take the native approach uh, um, and want to sort of try to optimize for all these weird string I/O and allocation tricks that I sort of threw at you over the last twenty minutes? Um, the first thing we want to do is we just want to stack allocate everything um, to try to keep the cost of allocation down and get to the point where this program generates no garbage whatsoever. Um, Taking the the garbage, basically taking the garbage collector out of the loop, um, has pretty dramatic effects on performance, as we'll see. Basically, what we're going to do um, is we're just going to iterate over reading a line from standard in until f gets returns null. That's when we know we've reached the end of the file. Um, and once we've got it, then we we're going to uh, use this scan and compare function. And what we're going to do is we're going to pass it as arguments, both the buffer that holds the current line we just read, the size of that buffer so we don't overflow it. And then it's also going to take these, uh, these pointers to the maximum count, the maximum word, and the, the year. Um, and we're just going to pass those pointers in directly so we can update them freely um, without having to worry about um, allocations or anything like that. Um, uh, you could also do it with vars, but I wanted to do it like in like C idiom, right? Um, so the the meat of this is actually in the scan and compare function, which is again going to stack allocate um, a count, a year, a dot count, um, and space for the word. Um, and then what it's going to do is it's going to use scanf to read from the line buffer we passed in um, into that that temporary space uh, right here. Did I? Um, checking the results of scanf is like evil, and I don't. I have a. I could give a talk on writing a, a good checker for scanf. It's horrifying. Um, but the idea is then we um, use the dereference offer operator, right, to check if the um, the value stored in the pointer to the max count is less than the value that's in the temporary count, right? And if we do, that means the word we just read is greater than the maximum. And if that's the case, then we just update all of the pointers that got passed in um, because they're all mutable pointers. Um, and that's where we'll use that safer um, string copy that we wrote. Um, so pretty standard. Um, Cool. So, so how does this perform? Um, it starts out pretty small. Like um, the native runs a little bit faster. Um, if you give it like hundred megabytes of, of of input data, like it it handles the file in like four point seven three seconds. On the JVM version, it's like five point four one seconds. But the more data you feed it, they just sort of rapidly diverge. Um, so, what's interesting, right, is that it's not like this is generating a large heap or anything. Um, like it's even the JVM version, right, should be discarding all this data, but it seems like the churn of all those allocations are just uh, killing it. Um, so that like by the time you get to like even like th uh, 300 megabytes, it's like the JVM's taking 16 seconds and native's doing it in nine. And then like all the way at the end at the full file, which is 1.7 gigabytes, um, it's like the JVM takes more than three minutes to do it. It takes 186 seconds, and native does it in about 43 seconds, so about five to six times faster. And right, these are diverging. If I fed it more data, it would continue to diverge. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's not like, a, oh, one is 20% faster than the other kind of difference. It's uh, like big O notation. There's actually a, a difference in the growth trends in general. Um, kind of difference. Um, uh, so yeah. So, how are people feeling so far? Everyone, who's uh, who's feeling super good about this? Awesome. Cool. Then I'll I'll keep going. Um, uh, sweet. Um, so for the next trick, we're gonna sort the that whole A file, right? Um, this is trying like like arguably what I just did, right? Was verging on like cheating, right? Because it's just abusing stack allocation, and anyone could write a faster. Um, 
like JVM implementation. So let's write something that actually uses the heap and isn't just doing a bunch of throwaway allocation, um, and that invokes Java's sorting functions, which are actually really good, right? And the JVM is brilliant at op optimizing like hot inner loops, like like sorting, right? So I would argue this gives the JVM more of a leg up on what native is capable of, um, and and see how this does. Um, the JVM version, I can't go super fast, but we're just going to read things into uh, an array buffer, right? Um, but it's basically the same code. It's just we're appending it to an array buffer. And then so we have it in an array buffer, we're just going to sort it like this. Um, so nothing complicated. Um, in native, this is harder, and it's going to require a few new techniques um, that we haven't learned yet. Um, so we have to actually model this ingram data as something we can store in an array called a struct, which we'll talk about in the next slide. We're going to read all of the input, all two gigabytes, into a single giant array. Um, and that's tricky, right, because we don't know how many there are. Um, and when we're allocating memory with the C functions, we have to know how big the arrays are, right? Which means we're going to have to resize the array as we go, um, which is going to be fun. Um, and then we can sort it. Um, to do this, we're going to need to know how to use structs to model our data in like a C and array-friendly way. We're going to need to know how to use malloc and realloc to handle these big, chunky arrays that uh, persist longer than, than the stack does. And we're going to need to use qsort, the glibc uh, quick sort function, which is awesome. Um, oh, there we go. Um, so structs basically work like this. Um, it's sort of the equivalent of a case class, uh, maybe with a bit of a tuple-ish feeling right now. Um, the idea is it's a, it's a composite data type uh, that is always laid out in contiguous memory, right? It only contains primitive primitive types whose, whose sizes are statically known. So the offset of any field in the struct is also statically known. That makes them work really well with arrays, because you know the size of everything and every item in the, the array is the same size. It means you can get to any field of any object in constant time. right? Um, the weird thing is that in C, right, they're treated more like na things with named fields. Um, in this version of Scala Native, they're uh, treated with like tuple-like uh, dot underscore one dot underscore two accessors. Um, I think Scala Native 0.4 is going to add named fields to them, which will be a lot nicer. Um, so this is just a, sort of a current limit of the implementation, but this will actually get easier um, in the very near future, and I'm really excited for it actually. Um, so now our uh, if so if we were using the the ingram cl case class and the JVM version which has the word the count the year the dot count all the things we had before um, in the JVM version um, the ingram data struct is just a C struct for which takes a C string an int an int and an int and we'll just have to keep track of the <laughs> of the offsets in our heads um, but I think we can manage it. Um, so the the one thing that maybe should be raising some question marks is, hey, how do you have a dynamically sized stri string and a struct whose size is known statically? And the answer is the thing that exists in that struct is not the variable size content of the string. It is the pointer to the content of the string, which is exactly eight bytes. Um, so we can know that every instance of uh, ingram data takes exactly 20 bytes, um, eight for the string and then 12 for the, the three ints. Um, the downside of that is that if we want to keep these strings around, we're going to need to allocate space for the strings as well. And to make all of this work, um, we're, we can't use stack alloc because we want things that outlive any given function. Um, so instead, we're going to use the legendary malloc for, for heap allocation. Um, because it's not like a Scala native intrinsic, it's just a C function, and actually a C function that's mostly in user space. It's not as friendly as, as stack alloc is, unless we wrap it or something. It just gives you a pointer of bytes of the size you, you ask it for. If you want it typed um, and you want it like being even vaguely sane, you have to do stuff like this. And then if you want to resize it, you have to do two casts in this crazy um, realloc thing. Um, the other thing is that um, like pointers aren't managed like they are in Java, right? If re if you resize a pointer from th uh, if if you resize an array from three ints to six ints, realloc may or may not move it to some completely different space in memory, depending if there's room for it, like on uh, uh, as a extension of of where it currently lives, right? Um, 
so what, what realloc does is it just returns the address of wherever the thing is, whether it was moved or not. But that means it could um, totally invalidate any wild pointers you have to this data outstanding. So you have to be really, really disciplined about pointers if you're going to even consider using realloc. Um, to sort of help with this, oh, oh, one really important thing. Uh, none of this is garbage collected heap, right? Uh, these, um, these basically, until you call free, these will just leak or stay around forever. Um, because I'm writing programs that read a bunch of data in, allocate a bunch of memory, and then exit. I'm just not going to call free, which you're allowed to do if your program exits. But seriously, if you um, do this in the wild, free all your pointers. Um, I didn't tell you to leak memory. Um, so if we wanted to like wrap this, and I'm gonna go fast just to recover some time, um, like I'd, I'd have like a wrapped array class which takes both a pointer to the data, and then it tracks both how much data we've used of of the array and what the capacity is, and then we can just allow the caller to um, both decide how much space to initialize it with, and then which decide when and how to grow it, um, which is sort of a compromise between some of the uglier um, uh, stuff that C makes you do uh, while still having like enough power to like manage large slabs of memory. Um, oh, the other thing is um, realloc is really slow, right? If we're copying three ints from one place in memory to another, that's not bad. But if like we're going to have gigabytes and we're going to be growing arrays that are like gigabytes wide, um, that's a lot of data. And copying it from one part of memory to another could become non-trivial. Um, and like malloc and realloc are also occasionally non-deterministic and non-linear. So we want to figure out how to cut down on the number of invocations of either malloc or realloc um, we're, we're going to get to in our program um, and be kind of strategic about that, um, which you'll see in like two slides. Uh, last but not least, you have QSort, um, which is really interesting because it's like an early C attempt at generic programming, um, right? Because it just takes a pointer byte as its first data argument. That's not a string. That's not a buffer of bytes. What that really is is that's just an, a pointer to an array of some opaque type. C doesn't have type parameters, so you have no way to tell it what that is. Instead, it takes two additional arguments, the number of items in the array and the size of each one. You just have to compute that and pass it in, right? And then if you do that, you can also pass in a comparator, which is a function pointer. C has function pointers. You can do a, if you don't care about lexical scope or closures, you can do a lot of, of uh, functional programming in C, um, right? And that, that function pointer has to take two pointer bytes in and return an int like any other comparator in a sane programming language. Uh, the way it works, right, um, is that inside the comparators, you can cast whatever data you know you're going to be holding in your array, and you, the programmer, have to like keep track of all that. Um, and like so like to sort alphabetically, we cast it to strings, dereference them, and then use string comp on them. Um, if we want to sort by count, we just um, cast them um, from pointer byte to pointer to ingram data. Um, and then pull out the count with the, the second field in the, the struct, right? Um, and dereference it. Um, and then return the, the, the delta between those two for because uh, uh, we want a descending count, right? Um, so once we've done all this, I know I've continued to throw a lot of technique at you, but now we have enough to actually write the main routine of our, func of our, uh, of our program. And this is going to be the fun one. Um, as you can see, I was saying we want to um, avoid allocation as much as possible. So we're going to allocate about a million um, of these structs at a time into our array, like which is 1 million items. They're 20 bytes each. So we're going to basically be pulling in about 20 megs of heap every time we malloc or realloc, which I was kind of surprised this worked. <laughs> uh, but that was fun. We're going to still use stack allocation for our line buffer. We're going to create a, an array um, with the block size, about a million items. Items. And then we're going to just iterate over um, standard, um, standard in like we were before. Um, we're get, and basically, every time we read a line, we're just going to check to see if we're at capacity. And if so, we'll grow by the block size we already set up. So like really, really basic, like dumb implementation of a dynamically growable array. But it works um, surprisingly well, as it turns out. Um, we're going to call our parse line function, which is going to be pretty similar to the one we wrote before, but uh, with some subtle differences. And we're just going to give it, what's interesting is we give it the line buffer we just read. And we, what we, we're doing is we're pointing it literally at array, the, the pointer to our data 
plus the offset of how many items used in it, which is going to be the, actually the address of the next free item. So we're just going to give it the address of the next empty, uninitialized um, struct in our array uh, ready for it to use. And then we can increment the, the array.used. Um, and once that's full, we have a full array, and we know exactly how big it is, and we can call quicksort on it. Um, which works quite well. As you can see, we take the array data, we cast it to a pointer byte because that's required. C does a lot of weird stuff with um, casting to and from void. Scala native doesn't, which makes things explicit. And then we pass in um, how big it is, um, et cetera. I'm a little low on time, so I'm going to speed up here. Um, the actually parsing it is straightforward. You don't even have to allocate. We're using a dumb trick with scanf to actually force scanf to malloc space for each string, but I can't go into that due to time. The cool thing about the performance is they start out even, natives faster by like half a second, um, but again, they continue to diverge. JVM actually beats a uh, native on sort uh, for quite a while um, until you're at like 700 megs. Um, but uh, the JVM also goes out of control as the heap gets larger, and it actually fails to completely sort the file after about 100, uh, 100, uh, 1,100 megabytes. Um, so yeah, I thought that was an interesting result. For the final trick, I think I have to go really fast because of time, um, but we're just going to aggregate. Uh, the trick is like uh, a brute force aggregation algorithm would ha require reading that whole big uh, thing into heap, then creating another smaller array into heap to do the algorithm to do the aggregation. We can avoid that because we know the data is already sorted. Um, so instead, we can just keep a much smaller running array, use a lot more of those stack allocation tricks, um, basically by just slinging around two pointers to like the next item in our big array and the previous one. Um, I don't think I have enough time to totally walk through the dance of this, but the slides are up and I would love to talk about them at length. Basically, the idea is that a parse line now returns a bool to tell you whether it actually encountered a new word or not, um, which lets you be even more conservative about how you allocate memory and how big the, the, the array gets. Um, and there's, again, it's, it's a bit of a dance, but it's also nothing we haven't used so far. I wish I had more time to go into it. Um, do, do, do. Um, and here, the performance sort of burns through the road again. It's about twice as fast as uh, as the, the JVM, even on the smaller files. What's interesting is it starts beating it on the sort again here immediately um, when the heap is this small, which uh, I've sort of struggled with understanding. It might just be because of the string allocations and malloc um, blowing things up on native in the previous example. Um, so it's not quite as categorical of a difference, like the JVM completes the whole file, but you can definitely see things remain mostly linear on native, right, um, and continuing to perform stably through the whole file, uh, while the JVM sort of, again, continues to diverge. Um, and I would love to talk about that more. So here's the hand wait. Yeah, that was the, the empirical part of the talk. Here's the opinions. Um, what I do think I've shown um, are that, like, one, this is a thing that you can do, and that if you're willing to use like manual memory management techniques, you will get not just like fractionally better performance, but like inter integral multiples better performance for some kind of applications. And then in particular, these um, these domains where this could make a difference are places that have one heavy I/O and two, and or two large heaps. Um, and if you accept those as things I've established, it raises the question: Well, where do you use Scala native? Um, and I, I mean, I, I, I want to be somewhat balanced here, but like big heap heavy IO is a lot of stuff people use Scala for, <laughs> like things like Spark, big old data pipelines, uh, eventy services like Akka and Finagle. Those are all things that can use a lot of heap and can do a lot of IO, which I think is interesting. Those are also projects I use every day and love, and they're my bread and butter, and they're great pieces of software. Scala native isn't going to destroy them, but the hardware is changing really fast, um, and I think there are new things on the horizon. Um, so also, performance isn't everything. This isn't safe. Uh, <laughs> try this at home. Maybe don't try this at work immediately. But we're getting much better at breaking things down to small pieces and at metaprogramming. And doing this safely is something we can really think about seriously. Um, like, look at some of Tiark Romf and Nada Amin's work. Um, on, like, they, they're generating C from Scala in like 500 lines of code. Um, this is a non-volatile uh, DRAM module for Intel, right? So once 
these things come online, you're gonna have these big heterogeneous heaps, hundreds of gigabytes that outlive your process and power cycles. Oh, and your network interfaces can read and write to them directly and synchronously. Um, like every assumption about how the memory hierarchy works that we've had for 20 years is gonna break um, as this stuff becomes mainstream in the next year or two. Um, and it really, I think it's going to change the game to the point of like how much data you can fit into a single vertically scaled, like very well tuned program without having to go distributed. Um, and I wish I had more time to talk about these awesome papers, but I don't. But I have to conclude with this observation that to the extent that our systems make a break with the past soon, that Scala Native isn't a step back to where we were 40 years ago with C, it's a step forward into the future. Thank you, that's my talk. Thank you very much, and you landed on time, exactly, <laughs> 5.30. Uh, I'd say two questions, maybe you're here for the evening, so you, uh, more question could be then later. I could just rush over. Uh, I actually didn't understand, well, uh, what's the advantage of using Scala Native instead of C? That's a good, qu that's a, that's a good question. Um, I find the there are a few touches to the type system, like there is not a void pointer in Scala Native, which I find makes things better. I think working with like functions and just the syntax of Scala Native has advantages over C. There is not a direct performance improvement of using Scala Native over C. At best, Scala Native will match C. I would use Scala Native over C because I like writing Scala a lot more than I like writing C, and I've 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 written C for a living. Yeah, and I, I think that's a matter of taste. I would rather write this than write the equivalent C program. If you if you would, I'd ensure I'd say you should write it in C. For me, the end game isn't me writing a ton of code like this, though. It's using like meta programming, macros, staged programming, some of the code generation techniques that our community is really, really good at, and that C macros are not good at, right? To write some of this for us. Um, uh, and try to have like the the power of unsafe techniques with some level of verification. The other direction you go, you could go is something like ATS. Do you know ATS? It's like an ML variant with a proof language for like checking your array bounds and verifying all the the bounds checking statically. Um, that's a really interesting approach that you could try to model at the type level and verify statically. Um, I mean, there's also claims that branch predictors on modern hardware are so fast now that you actually can check all your array accesses for free. <laughs> Basically, it's like less than a 5% overhead. Um, so it's like a lot of trade-offs, certainly. But I feel like um, more than anything, it might just be that C is calcified, right? It was standardized 40 years ago. The standard is broken. POSIX was standardized 20 years ago. That standard is broken. With Scala Native, we could rip out and replace all the broken parts of the user space of the standard library, right? All the string stuff that's broken, that's not in the kernel. We could just rewrite all of that. Um, that's that's where, where my head starts going. What if we rewrote like, and replaced all the string handling things to actually like track how big strings are? <laughs> like then you might actually have a much easier time of writing like systems programs that are known to be safe in a static way. I don't. I could. I could ramble about this for a while because I'm writing a book and it's my life. Sorry. Does that sort of get at your question? Cool. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Uh, oh. I'm afraid only one more question. <laughs> I don't know yeah? which hand was there first, yours or yours. Um, I was just wondering what the um, uh, garbage collection uh, situation is like. As far as I know, garbage collection is optional. You're not forced to mm -hmm. or not forced out of yeah. it. But the last time I heard about it, um, it was with a caveat that it's not like as production ready as on the JVM or something like that. I mean, the number of human engineering hours that have gone into the JVM's various garbage collectors is pretty enormous. Um, the initial release of Scala Native just had the Bohm uh, garbage collector, which is a very traditional and conservative one, which wasn't awesome, but worked. Um, I think 0.2 added a new MX garbage collector that Dennis wrote, um, which is pretty good. Um, I'm not an expert on garbage collector internals, but Dennis does have a talk 
maybe from Scala days a year or two ago, in which he has like really good performance numbers on how the new GC performs that I found pretty compelling. And it is like a pretty cutting edge, like uh, like up to date research kind of kind of garbage collector. Um, that being said, the ability to have a bright line between, hey, here's my code that uses garbage collection, here here's the code that doesn't is the thing that I get excited about. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for being the bad guy to cut the questions, but...